May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Last uh, Sunday, I was at the Villages, and uh, we had a great time. And, but one of the things that I called to their attention was a shift in the readings. Christmas, we really celebrated events, the coming of the shepherds, the angels, the babe in the manger. The lesson shift the following Sunday from thinking about not just the events so much as the impact those events have had on us. And the way God, in now revealing his son and the babe, is changing and has changed our lives. That's where we still are. And it is in that light, specifically, I want to look at the epistle lesson. John writes in shorthand. Very small phrases, very simple vocabulary. Uh, if you ever take Greek, where you start in the New Testament is in 1 John. It's like see Dick Jane run. Very, very simple phraseology. But he writes with the simplicity of someone who has lived with this for a very, very long time. There is a capacity that if you've lived with a subject for a long time, and especially if that subject is a relationship, you can speak in simple yet, in fact, very profound terms, each word having a long history behind it, saying far more than at first glance what the word might mean just because of the history. It's, it's like if you spend time with an older couple and they're still deeply in love after decades of marriage and they begin to talk a little bit about each other. It's almost childlike in what they have to say. And you can tell, even though they use very small words, the history behind it, the inferences, the implications are even if they just say, oh, he's just an old goat, <laughs> what's in that phrase has, has, is, you know, it, it, it's describing a lifetime of relationship. That's precisely the way the, the epistle of John is written. Long history, deep knowledge, small words, therefore profound implications in each of the small words, which is why I only wanted Sydney to read the first three verses of chapter three. Um, it switches subjects after that, and that would actually require a separate sermon. So that's why I didn't want to do that. Um, commentaries on the on the Epistle of John are this thick, mm -hmm. and with a reason. So what I want to do is very very briefly, with all that prelude, uh, talk a little bit about these first three verses in the epistle specifically in the light of the Incarnation, for which we are giving thanks. John writes these words. See, meaning behold. Take time to ponder and think about. See what? See the kind of love that the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. What kind of love? And the word is agape. It has everything to do with pouring out upon us mere mortals, that which we in no way qualified for or deserved outside of the free gift of what God has given us in Christ. And it's as if he's saying, stop and take the time to ponder this one. Don't just blithely sort of go over this, but think about the nature and the quality of that love that God would in sheer freeness, choose to pour out life on an entirely undeserving object. And that's you and me. I am, before the love of God, an entirely undeserving object, save for God's choice to choose to pour out that love on me. That's the kind of love so it's not just think about love in general, but this very specific kind of love. Uh, the King James says, behold what manner of love. And that's what he's trying to get at here. Think about the kind of love that has been poured upon us. That, notice, God's name, the Father, 
the one who is entering into this relationship as a provider, as one who cares, who, who in essence has birthed us in this new birth, who has called us as his own, who shields us and gives us all that we need. That's the implications for Father, that we should be called the children of God, his children. It's not something that is blithely conferred upon the human race. There is a selecting, there is a sense of you were called and God has made you his own. And that our, to use a theological term that John doesn't use, that our salvation, or the new birth, to use John term, that's been birthed in us, is a completely, freely, undeserved gift. We have been adopted into a family. We didn't naturally belong there. God has said, I've made you mine. We have been grafted in. We have been adopted. We have been made. And that's why we have been called because they are two sides of the same coin. We've been made and called children of this God, the one whom we can call because of this relationship, the Father who loves and cares for us. Not just any God or any idea of God, but a very specific understanding of what God has revealed himself to be in Jesus, who is Father. That redefines for many of us the very meaning of Father. I don't know what you're what your dad was like, but what God is trying, what John is trying to say, literally all through both the gospel and the epistles, is I'm redefining in essence father for you. This is what father is, real fatherhood. And this is the one under whom you've been brought in, adopted. What manner of love that the, that the father has given us that we should be called as children. And guess what? He says, that's what we are. In other words, God didn't just say, you're mine. And it had no effect. Remember, when God speaks a word, it's its own creative agent. It, when God speaks, it comes into existence. No one can resist the spoken word, the procreative, creative word of God. Remember Genesis, that God says, let there be light, and there was light. So that if we are called children, that means we have been made children. And that is what we are, he says. And then he keeps, he's going on. Two things are at issue. Number one, my neighbors don't think I'm a child of God. In fact, I am disparaged and persecuted for being a Christian. I mean, that's the historic context. And I don't often feel like I'm a child of God either. And he's really, so he's trying to really get at both of those things, which is why he underscores, and that's who we really are. Literally, despite what is being said about us, and despite how we may feel about ourselves at times. So, and that's what he underscores. The reason that the world does not know us is that it does not know him. If those who are outside of this covenant cannot see God's hand at work, how in the world can they recognize this hidden but still real new birth that God has worked in us? So, of course, they won't recognize us as God's children. It's just logical, isn't it? Is if he's saying, if they don't know him, how can they recognize his work? So that's what John says. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, and he underscores it again, we are God's children now. In other words, that not, that's not something to which we are aspiring. It is a, a declared imparted, organic fact. God has worked something, has, past tense, worked something new in us by adopting us into his family. And he makes the point of saying that, repeating himself, because we know that it's not all there. We don't see it. And that's what he says. But what we will be has yet to be revealed. It's a hidden work. But we do know this is that when he is revealed, meaning the consummation of the ages, when Jesus returns, changes everything, it's a new heaven and a new earth, when he is revealed, we will be like him. We don't see that yet. We still, and I, I brought a quote because I thought it was so to the point. This is actually John Calvin. He says this, physically we are dust and a shadow, and death is always before our eyes. 
We are exposed to a thousand miseries and our souls to innumerable evils, so that we always find a kind of hell within us, to the point. The more necessary it is, then, that our senses should be drawn from the view of present things, lest the miseries should shake our trust in that happiness which is, which is yet to be revealed. And that's what John is doing. In other words, in the midst of all that we see and know, both without as well as within, John is calling our attention to something that has yet to be revealed, but is surely going to happen. And that is our own transformation as a part of literally the transformation of the whole world. We will be like him. And we will see him just as he is. Because isn't it true? Now our, even our vision and our view of Jesus is, as Paul says, we know in part. Sometimes we feel close, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we see clearly, sometimes we don't see so clearly. None of that changes the fact that we are inextricably by adoption tied to God. And he has birthed that in us, undeserving people as we are, out of his sheer gift of love. See, all of that's true regardless of what our experience is in the moment. And that tells us, because that's the case, that we will be completely transformed and made like him, just as he is. And, last note, a little bit of a shift, ethical implication. All who have this hope in him, what, purify themselves just as he is pure. To put it another way, because even though I can't always see it, even though I don't always know what's going on, even though I'm very unsure of what's going on inside of me, even though I don't understand all that God is doing, much less, gosh, sometimes I even wonder whether he's even there. The fact of the matter is, is that I am being told in a very clear way, and I'm holding on to that, that God is real, that what he's revealed in Jesus is true, and that he has birthed something new in me that I don't deserve, and I want to get on board with that. To use very contemporary slang about he purifies himself just as he is pure, having this hope. I want to be a part of what God is doing. Unsure as I may be of what that is, I want God to take me. I want to learn how to cooperate with God's work in my life. I don't want to fight against it. I want to become. And so, in that sense, John is saying, in the light of all that we have, he has, God has given to us, how can we not say yes to his work in us? And it is in that that John begins to talk about the impl ethical implications. What I wanted to do there was just stop and say, behold, marvel, and say yes. Amen. Amen.